my fellow hunters, uh, this is Rosa Scheib with um, another hunter update, or hunt update, if you will. Uh, today is June 10th. Uh, so far as the recording of this particular episode of Satoshi's Treasure Hunters, there has not been a new uh, clue release for a new key as of the recording. So we are pretty much kind of at a momentum kind of at a standstill, if you will. And here's the reason why. So let's have a look at where we're at as far as the hunt goes. So far, we have the Earth Key, the Bun Key still out. The Clan Key um, ticker is June 15th, uh, midnight GMT time is when uh, if your particular clan has completed the task of having the most successful, uh, you know, longest consecutive uh, clan chain, if you will, then you get this unique key. So we have all the way to June 15th to receive that revelation. The business key and the art key, which is not on the site, is also out. So we have the earth key, the bun key, the business key, the art tour key, and the clan key five keys out uh, and there's really everyone's pretty much still stuck in the same spot of the earth key and the abun key uh, the clan key pe there's different groups trying different things um, I'll show you some of that uh, it's interesting what people are attempting to do uh, and we'll get into it a little bit. Um, I kind of touched on it on clue day, but I'm going to go a little bit in depth why I don't think this particular key is going to get much traction within the community because I'm going to discuss privacy and its association with um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general and its association, or at least the thread, if you will, within the um, cryptocurrency community. So that's where we stand as far as the keys go. Um, it's progressing. It is what it is. Uh, I did want to talk about the, about some groups. And um, I've been talking about PGP, which I will... basically say that I have been attempting to do a PGP... Um, breakdown if you will or explainer and I just don't feel comfortable releasing the episode I, I personally understand it but I don't think I'm conveying the information in a manner that uh, anyone can understand and I don't want to misinform people or confuse them so basically what I want to talk about when it comes to PGP is that it's just a verifying mechanism uh, as you can see here through the block stream satellite communication when it comes to the clue for the art tour if you will the message which is 323 and you can find it on the hunt is on site um, the clue is we're taking some time to cultivate our appreciation of the arts remember as bob ross says we don't make mistakes just happy little accidents first stop on the sta uh, st art tour and then has the website of course off of course, art is often a must be seen in person to be fully appreciated. If one is in any rush to appreciate the piece, a large expenditure of worthless fiat may be necessary to gain access. If one is a bit more patient, the work can be viewed for free a tad later. And then it's signed by the, um, the Game Maker's uh, release key, uh, which you can verify. Uh, through Keybase or any um, PGP decryptor where you can, when you pull the, uh, when you take the public key, take the mes messenger and verify the information. Um, we already went through this when they first released um, their key uh, through Keybase. So I just wanted to state, you know, to kind of reiterate that it's important that when they release these, um, release this information, through the Blockstream site that they're that is signed and verified. Um, so other hot news, their email was very behind when it came to releasing 
information. It was actually two days behind um, when it came to the clan key, which uh, was a little surprising. Um, they still haven't updated their SMS method. Um, there still hasn't been a blog post by Eric explaining or breaking down. Uh, he stated it in the, one of the Telegram chats, uh, the unofficial one, if you will, that he was more than willing to kind of break down how people could have solved the hunted key and found field agents two and three. That hasn't happened. Uh, the releasing of the public address has not occurred. Uh, by the game makers uh, indicating um, the bitcoins that are available if you will what that exact amount is let's see uh, any tools that would be associated with the the hunt has not been released and there really isn't a consistent like timeline frame work if you will like how long this game is going to be it's just a little weird uh, but this game started in April, all of May, we're in June, I say around July, towards the end of July, I think the people are going to start pressing more. Right now, the summer time, you know, people are getting out of school, you know, kids, work stuff, vacation, so there's a bit of a lull of activity that just happens in general in cryptocurrency space. There's always a dip between May, June, July, and August of people's activities, just by the very nature of how young the the, the space is, but the people that participate in the space, many people were, you know, seen tales of middle school, teenagers, 2009, it's now 10 years later, so if they were maybe in high school, they just, you know, finished off college, masters, you know, getting started in jobs, things of that nature, on the very lowest end, if they started like in the sixth grade or something like that, they're just midway through college possibly. Uh, space is fairly young in that sense. Maybe have not started families because people of this generation started families a little bit later, or they just started having small kids. So the you know, the space when it comes to summertime is very reflected of that. It's just, there's just a, just a dip, just a lull, if you will. Uh, so I anticipate that perhaps things will picked up again in the fall as far as activity participants, unless something mega or major occurs to where there's a significant traction when it comes on behalf of the game makers and releasing the keys and getting some more excitement when it comes to uh, people participating. Um, you know, solving the puzzles, um, getting the keys, and moving on to the you know the next key, and and just racking up those keys, if you will, until they're you know we reach the point to where this thing is solved. But we're a long way from there. Another thing I noticed when I was just looking through the uh, block stream and any information about the Satoshi Treasure Hunt. I found that this, uh, the Dream Hunter team is coming, Satoshi Treasure staff, be careful. Other hunters of the world, take your keyboards and join our elite team. And then these, this number information right here, I haven't personally deciphered it yet, um, but I also haven't put too much effort, effort into it. I just found it very interesting that um, there's po possibly another public team or clan, if you will, out there. And then let's kind of look at the Twitter, if you will. So in the proof of work uh, newsletter, uh, Eric, uh, which is a newsletter he's been doing for some time, it gathers the news around the space and some very interesting projects that are occurring um, across the spectrum. It's not Bitcoin exclusive. Um, anything that is seeking to improve the, the cryptocurrency community that is legitimate, um, he has been keeping track of various projects and information within the particular newsletter. So it's a great perusal, if you will, of what's happening in the space and having an idea of different projects that are, that are happening, their progress, that are popping up, that are interesting. Um, another one would be uh, the Bitcoin Optech, which is very Bitcoin specific. It gets very detailed. They've been doing a series of posts explaining um, Betch. Beach Betch 32, which is an address format of a mechanism and means of making it just fundamentally easier to utilize Bitcoin. Um, like on the on the 
under the hood, if you will, when it comes to addresses and UTXOs and privacy and why it's important to have that particular address format and how wallets can adopt and what it does and what it is doing. And that's called Bitcoin Optect. As well as the different BIPs and the proposals from Taproot, Lightning, um, even a little bit about Mimble, Wimble and Grind, um, when those particular papers came out, breaking out down of those, different privacy proposals, what's just basically going on within the Bitcoin space, if you will. So there's various clans, Steam clan, um, San Diego crypto clan, all these clans are attempting or trying to, um, as presidents, trying to race towards uh, June 15th, uh, midnight GMT town, uh, G GMT town, GMT time to find out, uh, you know, if they are going to be the winners of the uni, uni key. It'd be interesting to see if any clan, that clan that wins will release that key to public or keep it to themselves. Or maybe down the line, you know, because they, they're the only ones that have it. I imagine once you get closer to towards the 400 number it, with these unsolved keys or unique keys, that there might be a marketplace to start selling those keys as a, you know, maybe you're so far behind that you're not able to uh, get close to that 400, but you have certain keys where you can kind of guess or hazard a guess, or even an educated guess of like what point people are in start a bidding process. But we are a long ways from there. And one last bit as far as updates go, um, Armchair Adventures is a, a YouTube, channel that is also following the Fazoshi treasure hunt they did a shout out to me so i'm shout doing a shout out back to them i will have a link in the show notes to their channel as well as the end of the video i will have a link um to their channel as well and in the in the show notes i have a link to the other channels that i've observed um in the space that are public and are on youtube that are disclosing um and following the hunt i will also look at dlive um BitTube and any other video services out there that people might be interested in watching and helping um, them follow along uh, what's happening within the Sochi Hunter space. A number of these uh, channels, these guys are devs or at least have a fam familiarity with um, the technology as far as uh, having participated in um, Capture the Flags and other puzzle um, games if you will and break down certain mechanisms and means of finding and breaking down the different clues if you will so there'll be a link of different uh youtube channels um in the show notes and that's pretty much it as far as updating on what's happening with the, the clan key um and just in general what's happening with the hunt um i really have nothing much else to say uh other than that, I will be doing a book review of The Burning Chrome. I'll be releasing that probably Tuesday. Um, that was the book that was one of the objects that you had to give to Field Agent 2 in order, once you found him, in order to obtain the key from him. It is a William Gibson collect, short story collection. It's a very fascinating set of short stories. Um, I had some thoughts about possibly there might be some hints or clues, if you will, with that particular book when it comes to the hunt. But in general, it'll just be an overall view uh, review of um, that particular set of sort of stories. I'm still going through the William Gibson's catalog, um, almost done, and I'll just um, here and there. I'll just particularly with the comes with the Sprawl, which is his most famous trilogy of books, it has the Necromancer, um, which is one of the books he's most famous for. I will also uh, doing a book review on that. And then I will talk about some of this other stuff um, as I feel it suits it, uh, feel it kind of suits the needs of the hunt, if you will. But I felt it was important just for my education to have uh, a re-familiarity with um, his work because it's clearly a bit of an influence and hints of uh, verbiage and usage and just from the game makers themselves, uh, particularly Eric talking about William Gibson as an influence on the game and cyberpunk in general. All right, so let's talk about privacy. So what is privacy? I'm just gonna go straight to the Wicca. 
give the, the most basic description, if you will. Uh, privacy is the ability of an individual or group to seclude themselves of information about themselves and therefore express themselves selectively. The boundaries and content of what is considered private differ among cultures and individuals, but share the common themes. When something is private to a person, it usually means that it's something inherently special or sensitive to them. Uh, the domain of privacy particularly overlaps with security, um, confidentiality, which should include the concept of appropriate use as well as the protection of information. Privacy may also take the form of bodily integrity. The right not to be subject to unsanctioned invasion of privacy by the government, corporations, or individuals is part of many countries' privacy laws, and in some cases, constitutions. All countries have laws which some way limit privacy. As an example of this law, would be concerning taxation, which normally requires the sharing information about personal income or earnings. In some countries, individual privacy may conflict with freedom of speech laws, and some laws may require public disclosure information, which would be considered private in other countries and cultures. This was a major concern in the United States with the Supreme Court passage of uh, Citizen United. Privacy may be a voluntary sacrifice, normally in exchange for a perceived benefit, and very often with specific dangers and losses, although it's, it's a very strategic view of human relationships. For example, people may be ready to build their name if that allows them to promote trust by others and thus build meaningful social relations. Research shows that people are more willing to voluntarily sacrifice their privacy if the, the data gathered seem to be transparent as to what information is gathered and how it is used. And I, I think we can, well, wait, okay. In the business world, a person may volunteer personal details, often for advertising purposes, in order to gamble or win a price. A person may also disclose personal information as part of being an executive for a publicly traded company in the U.S. pursuant to federal security laws. Personal information, which is voluntarily shared, but sometimes is stolen or misused, can be led to identity theft. The concept of universal individual privacy is a modern construct primarily associated with Western culture, British and North America in particular, and remained virtually unknown in some cultures until recent time. According to some research, the concept sets Anglo-American culture apart from Western European cultures such as French or Italian. Most cultures, however, recognize the ability of individuals to withhold certain parts of their personal information from wider society, closing the door to one's home, for example. The distinction or overlap between secrecy and privacy is uh, ontologically so, though, which is why the word privacy is an example of an untra untranslatable lexeme. So it's not a, a word that's in pretty much every kind of language. And many languages do not have a specific word for privacy. Such languages either use a complex description to translate the term, such as the Russian combining the, the meaning of solitude, secrecy, and private life, or borrow from the English privacy, uh, such as Indonesia uses privacy or, or Italian law privacy. The distinction hinges on the discreteness of interests of parties, persons, or groups. We can have uh, emetic variations depending on cultural mores or individualism and collectivism, and the negotiation between individual rights and groups. The difference is sometimes expressed humorously as when I withhold information, it is privacy. When you hold information, it's secrecy. So there you go with the basic kind of concept and description. Now, within the space of cryptocurrency, in particular with Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin is a pseudonymous um, economic system. You do not have to disclose your, your personal information or data if you don't want to. And if you're careful enough, uh, there are these things called blockchain explorers, your Bitcoin or Bitcoin addresses or activity uh, through, you know, social media usage or data tracking, if you will, cannot or will not be traced back to you if you're, you're careful enough. But when it comes to Bitcoin addresses, uh, is the general use rule is to use uh, a different address for each transaction uh, if you can, um, you should always use uh, CoinJoin to mix your Bitcoins for your transaction to increase your fungibility and your anonymity from um, blockchain explorers so they can't, no one can know like where you received your Bitcoin or where your Bitcoin comes from and kind of obfuscate the uh, transaction itself so you can have some pri privacy and anonymity. And fundamentally within a space you know privacy is heavily emphasized for people to be able to uh utilize as a as a mechanism as a tool as an inherent right if you will now bitcoin was not by design built in with some of the privacy protections that people 
um, necessarily wanted. Uh, for example, the public blockchain, the, the whole point of it is it's to be transparent. You know where the coins are going or moving across the blockchain, so you know the amount to each associated address. And with that, if someone's identity is associated or tagged, for example, I've done this in the past and, and will continue to do so, I will public... I will share a public address for donations or whatever. I will share a public address for donations or whatever. That address will be associated forever with my my identity. And so some people may not want to send Bitcoin to that because my identity is associated with it. Or because they know that public address, they know how, you know, how much of a Bitcoin I have. And that could potentially make me a target for theft or intimidation or things of that nature. So for some people, that is, that's a bit of an issue. And there's different coins that have attempted to address that. There's different mechanisms like Grin, Mimblewimble, um, the mechanism of coin join to obfuscate uh, where coins come from and where they're going. Uh, Privacy-focused wallets like Wasabi you know, address and Samurai Wallet address to the ability for people to you know, obfuscate their privacy while still maintaining the the transactional level of everyone knows where where the Bitcoins are going, are kind of going to, in the sense they know how many Bitcoins are in existence, how many Bitcoins are being transacted, um, everything in that sense, the value sense is, is public in nature. So you don't have the issues of double spending or faking coins or, or in, the, in the case of faking coins, um, forgeries, things of that nature. And because of this, you know, people have done different ways to making their stuff anonymous, you know, cash buys, uh, not KYC or AMLing uh, themselves on exchanges, uh, going peer to peer, uh, trying to earn their, their crypto directly, or if they already had uh, Bitcoin, you know, mining it directly themselves or other coins and then um, shifting or exchanging them through what used to be a thing, um, shapeshift. Uh, you could do so without K- KYC and AML in yourself, but that's not the case anymore. Um, as those mechanisms of exchanges and uh, trading coins are becoming increasingly and increasingly uh, regulated, the ability to not um, hand over your personal identification is becoming a bit more difficult for many different people. And because of these things, people you know wish to retain, retain their privacy within this space. Um, it's when they the you can say the points of that gravitated people to this space to cryptocurrency to this new economic system was the ability to be private to be discreet if you will and not for necessarily for nefarious pur- uh, purchases or designs you know like there's always an overemphasis on you know purchasing of drugs narcotics um sex trafficking but morally, more like prostitution and stuff like that, not necessarily sex trafficking. And so, you know, the vices, if you will. And I think what gets lost in the sauce with all that is, oh, I oh, just won't get into that. But just basically people, one of the things the drawing to Bitcoin is the ability to be private, to be anonymous. And so in participating in the Satoshi treasure hunt game, which in which the prize pool is the value of $1 million in USD. Many people, you know, are expecting to somewhat participate in this game, if you will. Much of it is being done online. They're um, using, you know, Discord chats or um, some chat mechanism to gather Telegram, using handles and not, you know, full names or government names to participate in this game. They don't necessarily wish to or want to uh, disclose their personal information. Like, there, for example, there's there's a lot of private groups out there that nobody's aware or, or knows about simply for the fact that they're not sharing their information via social media and are just keeping within their group. They're probably fairly small. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are actually fairly large. But for, for the most part, you have no way of knowing exactly how many people are participating in the game and working together because they've chosen not to disclose that information. They chose to be private. And so when you have a community from the very beginning, from like pretty much 2009, from the very founder of 
this current iteration of peer-to-peer monetary value of Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a suit, which is a pseudonym for either a group of individuals, a single individual, male, female. Nobody is certain. There are certain traits uh, people may sh- associate with Satoshi Nakamoto for the fact that. Uh, the language is utilized. Uh, you can kind of get the age of the person. The fact that it most likely is a male individual. Uh, the hours of workage. I mean, there's so much that's been, you know, tea leaf through, if you will, about uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator and author of the Bitcoin white paper and the first uh, Bitcoin software program. But Satoshi Nakamoto was very careful about any kind of indicator of metadata uh, being disclosed. They didn't talk about foods, movies, any kind of personality traits that you might associate. There wasn't really too much humor or jokes, if you will, that can kind of uh, convey any kind of sense of uh, history or ethnicity or age, if you will. Wouldn't answer any type of personal questions, never spoke to anybody through voice or even a voice modification. Uh, did many, you know, use uh, privacy-focused email, uh, kept and retained enough privacy, if you will, to make it very difficult to find out who this individual is and basically, you know, bounce um, when they chose to bounce. And because of that and because the emphasis on privacy or the attempt to be um, private, you know, people have taken that as a, as a strong trait and something to model themselves after. You have, and I have a link in the show notes, uh, people like Jameson Lopp, who had, unfortunately, had experience with swatting and had his um, privacy information doxxed. Um, I have a, a link in the description about what doxing is. Uh, you know, James Lopp talk, talked about the extreme measures that he has taken in order to protect his family from not only just um, the way that he handles his own, you know, crypto side business, but he still has, we all still operate in a fiat system, like the different types of methods that he's done for, you know, debit and credit cards, uh, purchasing of property, uh, not just, you know, the home, but the car, even things like, you know, Netflix subscriptions and what, um, you know, VPNs and, you know, trying to get, you know, his data that is already in existence um, there are certain methods for different, like from the credit card, uh, the credit bureau companies to even the data brokers of getting that information off or done, changing of habits, uh, things that he has done, or even the type of jobs and the natures of the jobs he chooses in order to protect the privacy of himself and his family. And he's um, done a few different essays on the subject and has made efforts to make sure that he maintains his privacy so that the that his family is not placed in danger for the simple fact that someone wants to disagree with them. So they, they do a, a swat on his home that puts uh, not only his life, but the life of his family in, in danger. And that, that's an extreme measure, and it's a very costly measure, particularly in this day and age. And he, he states that he's in pretty much in a very privileged position to be able to take the, the certain methodologies that he does. And he breaks down, you know, what the cost is, you know, some cases, a minimum of $5,000 to $30,000 a year to protect his privacy. And so when you have that and you have the fact that, in essence, uh, cryptocurrency uh, comes from the cypherpunk movement, uh, you know, this is kind of anarchist meaning, if you will, movement of all these different, you know, collective minds and groups that, you know, emphasize on privacy, emphasize on free, free minute, freedom of movement, free minute of communication, uh, the ability to dispense information, encouragement of being, you know, peer to peer, decentralized, um, can be large, but not any kind of central authority or structure of governments, if you will. And keeping yourself, you know, anonymous was, uh, you know, something that emphasized, you know, protect one's identity uh, because it's very political, this movement. And cryptocurrency in and of itself is very political. Uh, keeping yourself, you know, kind of hidden um, by default. To have a 
a clue, if you will, a the ability to get a key in which you have to disclose your face, if you will, to order to participate. Uh, it seems that the the like, and I stated this uh, when the clue day, you know, dropped on clue day, that the game makers are failing to understand their audience, if you will. Now. As a, a mechanism, I can understand that you don't want to have like the same, you know, black hooded, you know, bandana face over and over again to create a, a, a blockchain. But I don't think that fundamentally rem- matters if the whole purpose is to ca- create a series of blocks. A single individual could, in essence, you know, do block zero and then block one and block two and block three and do the same, you know, hand movement and gesture and be outside and, and do all these things uh, and, and, in essence, create a block chain, uh, a continuous chain, as long as they keep, you know, the point is, you know, you have to be outside, you have to have your face, you have to have your phone up um, and be recorded, if you will, uh, The whole numbering, if you will, uh, the video and the movement and things of that nature. And I would, you know, maybe the person can switch up the clothes or whatever, you know, go from blue, red, green, yellow. Like maybe they have a bunch of hoodies or t-shirts or something of that nature. Um, Not being able to to keep their face hidden, even when the game makers give the the fact that you can have... um, a Twitter handle just created for the purpose of uh, creating or participating in the in the clan uh, key uh, block making. I think this is what why some clans don't have that many people in their chain, even if their groups themselves are very large, or the fact that groups are thinking of ways of either. And I talked about this about purchasing, you know, people's time and being able to create. Um, the biggest uh, chain, if you will, from people that are not really participants of the game, but are there for the very purpose, sole purpose of creating this continuous blockchain, the longest blockchain, if you will, up to June fifteenth. So I, I think what what I'm getting at too is, like I said, I don't believe the game makers fundamentally understand their um, audience. Now, I get why on a marketing standpoint, this is something that they would want to do because then they can, you know, tout that in videos and share it and try to get it viral. But you're dealing with a group of people that they're not interested in that internet fame. They're not interested in putting themselves fully out there. They're more than willing to participate in this game. They're even willing to go out to different types of locations. And there are ways to be in a public space and still be private. You know, you wear a hoodie, you wear some glasses, you wear a hat. You can obfuscate your face to prevent your identity from being revealed just in case there's any kind of surveillance. Uh, For most places, if there's any kind of like video video videography or filming going on, you have to have a permit to do that. So... You don't have to sign it, you know, the disclosure that to allow for someone to utilize your your face or information for marketing purposes. And if there's like one of those signs, I see it quite a few places what in places like large cities I've lived in, um, where there's filling going on, where just by the mere fact that if you go past this sign, your image can be utilized. You you have the mechanism or the means to navigate around um, that space if you have to. In some cases, you can't because maybe the building or the place you need to go to might be in that space. So maybe you call ahead and figure out when they were going to finish filming, if you can come back. But some cases, that's not convenient. And so it's a bit of annoyance, if you will. And so if you really want to protect your privacy, you kind of cover it up so that your image is not um, something that would be a desirable usage. And if it is, your your face is covered up and and nobody's going to know who that figure is so i i hope it goes well for the different clans that are operating out there and who are participating um in this particular key it will be interesting to see who actually um comes up on top there's a significant amount of time as we're recording this episode it is june 8th we have all the way to june 15th 
So that is it for this episode. Um, what you can look forward to is, you know, when Clue Day happens, I will do a Clue Day video. I also will be doing a video about, or yeah, a video review of the book Burning Chrome, which was one of the objects you had to give to one of the field agents. I did look at the other two books and let's just say that their understanding is above my pay grade is the best, um, simplest explanation is why I'm not reviewing that those particular books. I also will be, I'm almost not completely, but I also will be pretty much wrapped up with the William Gibson, um, books and I will be reviewing, um, different books. I think that might, um, have some impact on the, the hunt itself. So you can look forward to those videos down the line. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, watching and listening and, this is Hiroshi Shive, Associate Treasure Hunters, and on with the hunt.